Evening. Robert Thunder is also a key figure in a trial that begins tomorrow. He's not on trial, but is the key to the defense. Three people are charged with disorderly conduct, assault, and interfering with an officer. That officer is Robert Thunder, who the defendants say provoked them. Thunder has had problems with other complaints of excessive force. Those complaints will be admitted as evidence in tomorrow's trial. One of those previous complaints involved an incident last July. Chief John Locke said in a letter suspending Thunder that the suspension is intended to be a, quote, clear message this type of conduct will not be tolerated. Thunder can still appeal the suspension, but tonight Darren Ward talks to the man who says Thunder had no right to do what he did to him. Ron Peterson vividly remembers the incident last July when he says he was thrown on a patrol car and roughed up by off-duty officer Robert Thunder. I was very upset, very uh, traumatized, I guess. I, you know, I never expected to be treated in that fashion, and uh, I was afraid. Peterson says he saw Thunder chase a man who had been drinking heavily outside Saturday night jute box. He says he saw Thunder catch him and kick him repeatedly. That's when he got involved and asked for Thunder's badge number. And that's when the trouble began. He knew that I had observed him making an arrest at which uh, during which unnecessary violence was used and that I was going to report it. Officer Thunder has a long list of allegations against him, including using excessive force and assault. He was cleared of all but one until last May. Since then, he's had six more complaints filed against him. Three have been upheld, including Peterson's. Peterson says the bruises on his legs have faded, but not the fear that he could again be helpless against an officer's authority. Darian Ward, WCCO Television News, Minneapolis. Peterson has filed a civil lawsuit against the city of Minneapolis and Officer Thunder, who was unavailable for comment. In other news, Minneapolis police are using a new tactic in an effort to shut down most of the city's massage parlors. The city has kicked off its campaign by closing Angie's Health Club on Lake Street. Prosecutors did it by using a state law that says a building can be declared a public nuisance if three prostitution-related offenses take place in it over a two-year period. And police told our Jeff Kelly this is only the beginning. All of them. We're just going to uh, take them in steps. Police can go to any motel, hotel, restaurant, bar, call three out-call services and close the building down for a year. Uh, the law gives to both prostitutes and the police the absolute authority to close down any public building in the state. It's an outrage. Randall Tig represents someone involved with Donna Lee's Health Club, the city's next target. Tig says the law is unconstitutional and he plans to challenge it in court. Police say they're going after about a dozen massage parlors altogether. Governor Perpich signed a package of drug control bills into law today. The governor went to Bloomington Jefferson High School for the signing, the site of his State of the State address, which was devoted exclusively to fighting drug use. The new laws include more money to treat victims of drug abuse. They give more money to protect the children of drug abusers. They set up new education programs to warn against drug and alcohol abuse and toughen some penalties for dealing drugs. Independent Republicans charge the new drug laws are soft on crime by not imposing longer jail terms for drug dealers. The Senate Ethics Committee has scheduled a hearing date to look into Senator Dave Durenberger's financial dealings. That date is June 12th. The hearings will be open to the public and will be conducted much like a trial. The committee decided in February there was enough evidence of rules violations to conduct a hearing. Senator Durenberger released a statement tonight saying he looks forward to resolving the issues before the committee and he denies any willful wrongdoing. St. Paul hospitals now say they are treating eight people for measles, including a 22-month-old Hmong child who is intensive care. Six of those cases are new today. Yesterday, a 14-month-old boy, also Hmong, died of measles. Health officials say educating the Hmong community is an important step to fighting the epidemic. We have two reports, beginning with health and science reporter Ann Schieber. This is the scene now just about every night here at the St. Paul Health Clinic. Hmong-speaking workers calling Hmong families, telling them about the importance of measles vaccines. Health officials are recommending that Hmong children get their first measles vaccine at six months of age. To some extent, the effort is paying off. Today, the health clinic gave 40 more measles shots and questioned families about their immunization records at other health programs like this one on nutrition. The state health department wonders if that could have been done sooner. 
but local health care workers are saying they're doing the best they can with this rapidly growing outbreak. And the preschool age group is large enough and the measles exposure is great enough and it's such a contagious disease that we will continue to see cases. I'm Caroline Lowe. Health officials say that because of cultural differences, it's often difficult to convince Hmong parents that it's a good idea to stick a needle in a young baby who isn't sick. It's a difficulty in both understanding Western medicine and the idea of prevention. There also is a feeling that um, by providing these shots to their babies when they are so small and weak, to use their terms, prop is it, it troubles them. Health officials hope the current outbreak will help convince Hmong parents of the critical need for measles shots. The St. Paul Health Department can answer your questions about measles vaccinations. You can call the department at 292-7746. That number again is 292-7746. It's been known for years as the College of St. Thomas. Starting this fall, it becomes the University of St. Thomas, featuring a much bigger campus. Today, the school broke ground on a new library on campus. It also received good news from the St. Paul City Council. The council approved expanding the campus onto the property of the nearby St. Paul Seminary. Construction can now begin there. The name change becomes official in September after it's approved by the Higher Education Coordinating Board. It's quite a different mood on the Kent State campus in Ohio where tonight students are holding a vigil to remember those killed 20 years ago. Tomorrow is the 20th anniversary of National Guard members killing four students and wounding nine. The students were protesting the U.S. invasion of Cambodia. The guardsmen first fired tear gas, then bullets to try to put down that protest. Nine years of civil trials resulted in $675,000 for victims and their families. Puppies being bred at so-called puppy mills aren't fit to be adopted, according to animal rights advocates, and the mills should be boycotted. The U.S. Humane Society says some breeders are offering an unsuspecting public sick and deformed puppies, and some states are allowing the dogs to be marketed like objects. President Bush officially heard Lithuania's case for independence today. The president met with the republic's prime minister along with members of the U.S. Congress. Lithuania wants the U.S. to put pressure on the Soviet Union to favor independence. Today, Hungary's newly elected parliament came out with a resolution supporting Lithuania's plan. The president's home state of Texas has been inundated with floods. Just take a look at one dramatic example of the danger which happened today in Abilene. Two teens decided to go rafting in a rain-swollen river and they capsized. They struggled to swim for shore, but one grabbed onto the other, lost his grip, he saw his friend float downstream and disappear. Miraculously, he resurfaced downstream and eventually made it. I just went under as far as I could and I was going... I was on the ground just kind of crawling and it just shot me up. I was going, oh, Grasp, grasping for air and I said, ah. Both boys were wearing life jackets and they actually say they had a good laugh about the incident once they were safe. Oh, thank goodness it ended that way. Well, still ahead on the 10 o'clock news, high-tech ways to do a low-tech task. See, the complex machines built to pour from a bottle. And after weather, ways to make your wedding work in the 90s. We'll have some expert advice. And next in Dimension, the boating season is upon us, which means the boating accident season is also. Obviously, this would be a double fatality. Ways you can make your boating safe this year. That's next. This is the 10 o'clock news on Channel 4. From every... They are vehicles out of place at a boat landing, a squad car, an ambulance, and a hearse. Out of place unless an accident has happened, and two weeks ago it did on the Mississippi. A Twin Cities woman was killed when a boat she was in collided with another. Tonight in Dimension, the dangers involved in one of Minnesota's favorite pastimes. And what boaters can do to make it as safe as possible. Minnesota ranks first by far in the per capita number of boats. 700,000 were registered last year, and with that comes accidents. Last boating season, 16 deaths were blamed on boating accidents. And so far this year, three people have been killed. Two-thirds of the accidents are blamed on alcohol, and nationwide, authorities are pushing safety. On the ambulance, there's been a boating accident. Um, is it possible 
Last year, 473 drunk boaters failed to pass this breath test. But drinking and boating is just part of the problem. Tom Stewart has tonight's Dimension Report. It's that time of year again. Record numbers of boaters eager to test the waters. Authorities more anxious than ever to prevent fun from turning fatal. Well, uh, the majority of boaters anyway will go and rent a boat or buy a boat and drop it in the lake and just take right off without any uh, thought as to what they should be doing. One of the most commonly occurring two-boat accidents seems to be the rear-end collision. This test tape used to teach authorities how to investigate water accidents shows the worst case scenario. Obviously, this would be a double fatality. Experts spot the same problems time after time. The majority of people that are getting in boating accidents do not have formal education in boating safety or on how to operate boats. Yeah. And especially in fatal accidents, that plays a real important role. Okay, look in here and tell me the letters that you see in all three yellow boxes on line two. Authorities point out that you need to take a series of tests to get a license to drive a car. But with a boat, basically, you just need these. They operate a boat similar to how they would a car, thinking the same rules apply, and they don't on the water. How you drive out on the road may provide a clue to the way you act behind the wheel on water. But too many expect their boats to behave like cars. So people do get into trouble when they start trying to steer just like a car. Tom Rosini, a water safety instructor for the Minnetonka Power Squadron, agreed to show us how fast that can get you in trouble especially in boats as big and fast as his 26-footer. Some boats have more pickup than others. Uh, some boats will, uh, will indeed uh, uh, be almost as quick as some cars. Quick, all right, but completely different to handle, a fact that shows up when you try turning. Yeah, you don't have to worry about the stern of your car swinging out hitting something when you make a corner, uh, whereas you do with the, with the boat. No comparison whatsoever when you need to stop in a hurry. People who uh, try to cut it too close are the ones who have accidents, run into docks, run into piers, run into other boats because they simply cannot stop as fast as, uh, as they are used to with a car. It's not just that it takes longer to stop one of these, it's that when you do run into trouble out here, there's nowhere to go but down. You can, however, significantly improve your odds by taking some simple steps. Wearing a life jacket, for starters. 90% of boaters killed do not. If they're not on, uh, you get thrown in the water, you have a little problem. Yeah. Other safety measures can prevent accidents from happening at all. A fire extinguisher a compass, depth finder, radio. Proper lights so you can be spotted on the water at night. Learn the horn signals used for navigation. A lot more can be riding on a honk out here than on the highway. If you were going to pass uh, starboard to starboard, you would signal and they should respond and then you would pass safely. Out here, you also need to know how to read the road signs, particularly with such low lake levels. We have uh, three buoys over here uh, with uh, vertical uh, red stripes, which uh, are indicating to uh, stay out of that area. Those are uh, considered danger areas. So you need to know the rules of the road out on the water as well as on the highway. When a crunch comes, your reaction time often needs to be even sharper in a boat than in a car. I'm Tom Stewart for Dimension. If you want more information on boating safety or would like to sign up for a safety course, you may call the Minnetonka Power Squadron at 
This is a new Passat, Volkswagen's first ever mid-size family sedan. It has air conditioning, tilt steering, and more passenger room than any Volvo. Four-wheel disc brakes and a more powerful engine than a Honda Accord. All standard and all for only $14,770. And this is absolutely nothing, which is all you need to enjoy the driving experience we call Farfic Nugent in any new Volkswagen. Meet the Johnsons, a nice couple with a bad grass problem in their soybeans. Little do they know as they watch for some sign that their post-herbicide is working, that help is on its way. Assure from DuPont. Assure goes to work on Foxtail faster than Post and gets shatter cane, volunteer corn, and other tough grasses fast. So keep up with the Johnsons. Get dead grass fast with Assure, only from DuPont. Right now at Slumberland, take your choice of these completely coordinated living room sets. Sofa, love seat, lamp, oak coffee table, an end table. All yours for the spectacular price of just $999. Buy now and you also get this five-piece oak dining room set. Free. That's what I said. Free. If you think you can get more for less anywhere else. People have been trying to copy the Plymouth Voyager for six years. Maybe they should get Plymouth to build them. And they could just stick their name on the front. Be a lot easier. A follow-up to our Dimension Story on boat safety. A lot of people may be on the water in Wisconsin this weekend. That's right. And next weekend here in uh, Minnesota is the fishing opener start. Wisconsin this Saturday, uh, Minnesota next Saturday. And water temperatures in the lakes are still running between 40 and 50 degrees. That is cold. Mm -hmm. Fall overboard in that kind of water and you don't have much of a chance. Life preservers are mandatory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, gorgeous day today. A few more days like this, we could warm those lakes up a little bit, but it's going to take a few more, I think. 70 degrees this afternoon, 44 for an overnight low, and of course, no precipitation. We've been watching this rain to the south of us inch its way northward out of Iowa, and that's really what it's doing tonight, still inching its way. Whether it gets here or not, I don't know. We may grow long beards before it's here. Barometer 3020 and round the rise. A lot of clouds to the south of us. Those clouds have been building northward and kind of brushing across the southern part of the state all afternoon from time to time some clouds making it as far north as the Twin Cities looks like we will eventually go mostly overcast we're also watching a little area right up here We've got some much colder air behind it and as that kind of swirls across the state we may see some showers in the northern part of the state could even get far enough south to mix with the moisture here tomorrow to trigger some thunderstorms by afternoon. In the meantime, that swirl of clouds is causing some real problems onto the south. You saw the, the flooding down in Texas. Well, the rains have ended there in the Dallas area. The Trinity River is expected to crest tomorrow and near an all-time record high set back in 1949. And even though the rains have ended, the runoff that continues to run off out of the uh, lakes that uh, have the overflows and the streams and all that, still going to make that Trinity River continue to rise. Right now, the showers and thunderstorms are along the leading edge of that front that's down to the south and producing severe weather again. Tornado warnings in effect all the way from parts of Missouri down into Louisiana and eastern Texas. So still a few more hours of some pretty heavy thunderstorms down to the south of us. And here's the rain up through Iowa. So far not up into the state of Minnesota. Here's the temperatures that we were talking about. That cool front up to the north, look at that. War Road right now is 39 degrees. They had 40 for a high temperature this afternoon. While we were 70 degrees, temperatures here in the southern part of the state still holding up in the upper 50s and lower 60s. There's the culprit for all the nasty weather down to the south. It's been moving very slow. It's going to kind of get on his horse and take off here though. It's going to move very rapidly up into the Ohio River Valley over the next 24 to 36 hours. Brush us with some clouds and some precipitation, leaving behind some partly cloudy skies for the weekend. Really not too bad of a weekend coming up. Our high temperatures tomorrow should again climb into the mid to upper 60s. A little cooler down here to the southwest and that's going to hold right on into the weekend. Well, 
Here's our forecast for tonight. Increasing clouds, 46 for a low with southeast winds at 5 to 15 miles an hour. Then for tomorrow, partly sunny with a shower, maybe even an isolated thunderstorm possible. High temperature of 68 degrees. Tomorrow night, we should again drop down to the 40s under partly cloudy skies, maybe a scattered shower lingering. And then for Saturday, partly cloudy with a high temperature of 65, leading us into the rest of the weekend. Sunday, maybe a little bit cooler, high temperature of around 60 degrees. Next chance of any precipitation is on Tuesday, but high temperatures holding in the 60s, and right now the weekend is looking good for outdoor activities, including the Wisconsin fishing opener. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> right. Thanks, Mike. Tonight, a look at weddings in the 90s. Some are simple ceremonies. Others would require massive planning. Darian Ward gets some expert advice for us tonight on avoiding some of the pitfalls. They are princesses in their own fairy tales, waiting for their knights in shining armor. Unfortunately, some brides-to-be dream a little too much about their wedding day and don't start planning it until they're forced to. The child will just carry the pillow. He should carry it. That's where Sherry Rice comes in. She's been planning weddings for nine years. People are not organized enough. What my recommendation is is that a bride will get some kind of an organizational book with a calendar in it, keep all her dates written down, all her appointments, names, addresses, phone numbers, sizes of her bridesmaids, so that she has everything right at her fingertips. Number two, I'd say you need to plan a budget. A lot of girls just start out having absolutely no idea what they have to spend. No matter how much you have to spend, your budget can be sliced like this wedding cake, with 50% going to reception expenses, 18% set aside for the gown and accessories, 10% each for the photographer and music, 8% goes to flowers, and 4% for invitations. One of the pitfalls that can easily turn into a minefield is trying to please everyone at the wedding. The bride-to-be needs to keep the lines of communication open. She needs to find out what her parents want as well as what her fiancé's parents want. But ultimately, she has the final decision. If you find a professional wedding photographer, you can usually avoid pitfall number four. You need to know what shots you want in advance so that he knows, so that no one is forgotten. And something else you may want to think about before getting hitched is getting a wedding consultant. For a couple with very little time on their hands, wedding consultants are blessings with a price tag. With Bob Cowan, I'm Darian Ward, WCCO Television News, The Twin Cities. Most wedding consultants charge a flat fee of between $200 and $1,000 for their services. Others get paid on an hourly basis or a percentage of the wedding costs. Another pitfall to watch out for are contracts. They need to be itemized so that couples know exactly what they're getting for the price they're paying. One of the most important drives towards the 21st century was a test drive, not of a car, but of a gasoline. It's happening, it's up, you're excited, and... Hoofta. These identical houses have identical lawns. Up, Jim. 